a pleasure now to introduce uh, Professor Rafa Revolo, who is director of the IAC. Uh, for the next hour or so, he will be introducing, he will be providing some historical background of our institution and the observatories that it runs in the context of the cosmological science that has been, has been conducted in, this, in these places. So, Rafa, please. Um, it's a great pleasure to work on you all here in, in Tenerife as director of the Institute. I was asked by the organizers to, to tell you what is the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canary Islands and also to tell you about uh, work on cosmology and astroparticle physics. And that's my goal. So this is the outline. Um, basically, I will introduce the Institute, our observatories, which are very important, our research program and technology program our large telescope programs, and finally I will talk about uh, cosmology and astroparticles a little bit. I cannot review the, the full activity of the Institute in this field, but I will give you some outlines. So, the Institute is a public research uh, consortium, which involves the Ministry of Science and Innovation in Spain, the regional government of the Canary Islands, the University of La Laguna, next to us, and the National Council for Research. Uh, you see here the five uh, locations of the Institute. We are at the museum next to the headquarters here. And uh, we have also two kilometers from here, the Technology Center. This is the uh, baseline, uh, the base level um, headquarters in La Palma, the other island, which I think some of you will visit. And of course, the two observatories. This in Tenerife and this one in La Palma. Uh, a very important feature is the international cooperation. We have uh, 60 uh, running collaborative programs in our observatories. Many institutions have their own facilities in our observatories. Spain provides the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure. And uh, in some cases, we collaborate directly with hardware or technology or support. In some other cases, uh, the institutes are very uh, independent and we, collabor we collaborate on the science uh, progress. So, these are views of the observatories. So, I encourage you to do the visits. This is here in Tenerife and this is at La Palma. 2,400 meters both. And there are about, uh, well, 40, I will explain in a minute, but there, there are a number of facilities from uh, solar physics to microwave um, CMB, cosmic microwave background uh, experiments, to uh, optical and infrared astronomy, to gamma ray astronomy. In total, uh, we have about uh, 20 countries involved and 40 astronomical facilities currently running in our observatories. And as I said, there are about 60 research institutions, mainly from Europe, but also from Japan, the University of Tokyo, from the United States, uh, universities there, okay, MIT and University of Florida and others. So these are the countries that are involved and, uh, well, 
um, in uh, very important thing is that uh, our skies are protected by a national law. That means that uh, um, we we protect light contamination to the sky, and because that would prevent uh, very deep observations. Okay, so. This is a feature that uh, is, was rather unique. It's not anymore, but it was rather unique uh, some 25 years ago. But uh, as I say, we, uh, we think that this is the key factor uh, in the development of the observatories. And now there are about 600 people working for astrophysics in the Canary Islands. 450 work for the ISC. They are staff at the ISC, our institute. The observatories produce about 500 refereed papers every year and about one third of those have uh, Spanish contribution. So we are not uh, imposing uh, Spanish contributions in all, okay? Just in those where we really participate. And you, you see here images of different facilities that are, uh, are running from the Sherenkov telescopes, I will introduce in a minute, solar physics, uh, and also uh, optical and infra visible and infrared astronomy, and some uh, other here, a closer view of the facilities at uh, La Palma. You see here the 10.4 meter optical and infrared telescope named the Gran Telescopio Canarias, Canarias Telescope, which is the largest uh, single telescope in the world. It was built by Spain and it has participation of uh, the University of Florida in, in the United States and also in Mexico. The William Herscher, 4 meter class, the Telescopio Nacional de Galileo, so this was British in origin, this is Italian, and then uh, Isaac Newton, again, it's uh, British. This is the Nordic telescopes for the five Nordic countries. The Magic, Sherenkov, uh, Liverpool University, the Solar Tower of the Swedish Academy of Sciences, and the Mercator from Virgin. So these are in La Palma, and if you go there, you, you will have the opportunity to see. Let me note, of course, the telescope that we have built uh, as an institute, the Grand Telescope of Canarias, this one here. Uh, it started operation about 10 years ago, okay? And uh, it has produced uh, about 700 research papers and um, some of them in, in quite multidisciplinary journals uh, like Nature and Science. This is the uh, suite of instruments that we have at this telescope. We, at the Institute, in front of us here, we built uh, our own uh, instruments. This one was built by the Institute, Osiris, that's a visible Spectro uh, imager and spectrograph in the visible. Uh, we have built also the corresponding instrument uh, for imaging and spectroscopy in the near infrared, EMIR. And the other instruments uh, uh, come from collaborations with others. Well, this is also built by our institute, high dispersion spectrograph, but all this came from our uh, collaborations with other institutions like the University of Complutense in Madrid or the University of Florida here and here and also now in Mexico, uh, this other Frida. Of course, this, the idea is that uh, this collection of instruments will be available at any time at our 10-meter telescope to do uh, quite a reaction, a fast reaction to whatever events uh, happen in the universe that you, you need to collect data. Um, there are facilities for solar physics. I will not describe in detail because this is rather far from, from your field of interest. But uh, let me note that uh, the largest collection of solar telescopes uh, for Europe is located here. Um, we, we had in the past the largest solar telescope in the world. Um, but now um, this is the 1.5 uh, meter in diameter. But now the Americans have a much bigger four meter class, the only one in the world, and they have now the record. But we are building uh, a similar telescope also uh, here. So we will try to keep Europe at the forefront of the solar physics. These are robotic telescopes that are distributed at Teddy Observatory. Uh, this is American, La Scumbris Observatory is American, but they are from, from other countries. Uh, and the robotic telescopes, I mean from Germany, from Denmark, you will see, if you go to the Teddy Observatory, you will see a collection of telescopes there that are very much dedicated to uh, single purpose science, in particular exoplanetary science. It's a lot of effort now ongoing on exoplanetary systems, and there are telescopes that are dedicated, small telescopes in the sense of one meter in diameter, 1.5 meter in diameter. That's, that's small as compared with those in La Palma. Here in Tenerife, 
we basically locate telescopes for dedicated programs. Our institute has six major lines of research, which go from um, solar physics, of course. We have a group, a very important group there. Um, exoplanetary systems, then st uh, stellar physics and interstellar physics, galaxy uh, evolution or galaxy and the nearby galaxies, and then formation and evolution of galaxies, and finally cosmology and astroparticles. Okay, that's a line of research in our institute. Uh, in total, there are about uh, 200 people doing science in uh, the IAC, at our institute, and. Um, Please to say that, of course, the organizers are staff of our, of our institute, the organizers of the school. The other 200 people in our institute, of 220 or so, are working for science. And they are basically technologists, engineers, who develop telescopes or instruments for our telescopes. And, of course, a fraction of uh, about 150 technologists and then a fraction of administrative people who support our, our general activity. We have a PhD students program. Uh, that's partly because, uh, I mean, that's a reason for us to, to uh, organize the winter school every year because we have our own important uh, group of PhD students. Every year we have 15 contracts for new PhD students. And now there are 69. It takes three to four years to finish the thesis here. Therefore, we have about 69 currently PhD students uh, at the Institute, distributed in the six lines of research, plus the uh, instrumentation technology. Um, technology program, uh, of course, we have to build, um, sometimes we have to build our instruments, and we do that in-house, or we subcontract uh, Spanish industry whenever, or European industry whenever it's possible. And, um, and you see we have laboratories for that, of course, uh, mainly in the field of optical and infrared astronomy, but also microwave technologies. And um, uh, basically all the other things that you need in order to develop uh, instrumentation and also uh, provide support to the scientific activity of the Institute, computing facilities, uh, space technology, uh, actually, we have been participating in space observatories for many years. Those you see here are missions that the ESA, the European Space Agency, have launched uh, since 30 years ago, Infrared Space Observatory, Solar Observatory, Planck, Herscher, Solar Orbiter, Euclid, next year, hopefully, and Plato, following three or four years from now. And then we have our own institute, uh, Microsat uh, program, uh, nanosat and microsat program for instance we <coughs> we develop uh, cameras that are uh, have been launched and put in, in space like this one and you can see well we also uh, produce technology for observation of of earth even if this is not directly related to astronomy we develop technology that then we apply also to future uh, astronomical satellites so the large telescope program is a very important activity of the institute and uh, it has now five uh, major facilities. Each is the largest in, his, in its class in the world. Okay, so we are, and I will explain that, uh, um, we are building the Cherenkov Telescope Array, the largest uh, collection of uh, Cherenkov telescopes in the, in the world. At the moment it's uh, in, La, in La Palma. Then we are working for the largest solar telescope, the European Solar Telescope, the largest robotic telescope, the new robotic telescope, and the ExoLife uh, Finder, which is a new concept for high contrast imaging to see planetary systems. Uh, and we are prototyping this, which may become a 50 meter class telescope. And we try to get the 30 meter telescope from the United States, uh, China, Japan, India, to, to be installed, all of them, in La Palma. Okay? So um, this is a big effort. For the Cherenkov telescopes, I will go into more detail. So simply, I will mention that uh, it involves a large uh, collection of countries. And um, it has two observatories, the north and the south. And I will explain why it is important for astroparticles, uh, this. But, um, uh, just briefly, the European Solar Telescope is an effort to try to understand the magnetic activity of the Sun, how it generates, uh, um, um, well, uh, high level activity means ejection of particles, accelerated particles that we do not understand, how this 
it goes uh, from the small scales that we can observe on the surface of the sun uh, up to the, the space weather. That's the name we, we give to the influence of the sun activity in, on, the, on the Earth. So these are the things that uh, we want to investigate uh, uh, with the full meter class telescope. Um, then, as you know, uh, there is a big effort to, to see where we can understand the chemical composition of the atmospheres of exoplanets like the Earth that we know exist in the nearby stars that we don't see. It's indirect uh, evidence. So we are planning um, a concept for a telescope that should be low cost, although low cost in these things is always hundreds of millions of euros. But uh, um, we are working on the concept for Nullin interferometry, which uh, should be of interest also for space future missions. So we are prototyping this kind of thing in order to be able to do a spectroscopy of Earth-like planets and nearby stars. So this is an activity that is on ongoing and the prototype is under construction with the other telescopes, actually, the Cherenkov and the Solar Telescope uh, in the new technology center uh, here, uh, 2.5 kilometers from here. So that was the introduction of the Institute. Um, now let me tell you about a little bit about the cosmology and astroparticle uh, line of research of the IAC. So um, some uh, highlights. Well, uh, if I have to select, uh, I, uh, my apologies for the two organizers because I'm not going to talk about their research. They, they will make sure that you know what they are doing. So I will talk about the research of others in our institute and uh, of course the activity related to Planck has been very important in our cosmology group and well a number of papers on the last uh, years came out with the results but uh, in, in year 2020 you have a good summary uh, with a collection of papers published with the latest analysis of the of the data uh, which I think it's uh, among the most relevant things that uh, we have been involved. Then on astroparticles um, we have the magic uh, uh, two telescopes at the observatory have been running for gamma ray astronomy for more than 10 years. And uh, well, recently you have here a set of papers like uh, this one on proton acceleration in thermonuclear nova explosions uh, uh, revealed by gamma ray observations with the magic telescopes, that's nature astronomy, or the detections of specific outbursts of, of uh, emission, gamma ray emission from of uh, different objects or the characterization of the spectral energy distribution of um, high energy uh, photons from different sources in, in our galaxy. Well, these are the kind of things that our groups do in this field. Let me go to the cosmology CMB part. We have CMB and we have large scale structure. So CMB research has been uh, a topic for us in our institute since the, the mid 80s actually. And, um, well, we, we finally got involved here in the European mission. The previous uh, discoveries came from um, research um, basically led by the United States. Um, but Planck has been a great success uh, setting, uh, among other things, uh, constraints on the basic parameters that describe the model of the universe. Okay? And uh, from this uh, fantastic map that uh, we were able to achieve, I think the, the best constraints um, ever have been set on parameters like the baryonic density of the universe or the, con the uh, density of the uh, matter in the universe and other uh, parameters like the spectral index of the fluctuations or the primordial fluctuations. There is some controversy, uh, obviously, around uh, uh, the value of the Hubble um, Lemaitre constant, uh, the rate of expansion of the universe, but um, overall I think uh, it was a great success, uh, the mission. And um, we, we now work to complement the results of the Planck mission. And in our observatory here, at Teide Observatory, we have uh, a number of experiments that are really planned to facilitate the next step. And the next step is uh, to try to identify the imprint of the Big Bang gravitational waves. Uh, you know that um, inflation uh, produced, um, according to theory, produced um, gravitational waves and that they have an imprint on the polarization of the microwave background, in particular of what we call B-modes. 
tensor modes. And uh, we are working to characterize all the uh, foregrounds that uh, may produce polarization in the CMB. And we do that with this experiment, these two telescopes that were built by our institute in collaboration with other institutes. Uh, these two are in operation at Teide Observatory. These are 2.7 meters each in diameter. And because of this experiment at low frequency, uh, we attracted the interest of institutes in Japan okay, that uh, built an experiment at high frequency, uh, above 150 gigahertz. We are in the range 1 to 40 gigahertz. And, uh, well, altogether, we are working at Teddy Observatory in order to measure the polarization of the microwave background at different frequencies and try to get uh, beyond what uh, Planck did in polarization. It's possible to do um, more sensitive observations uh, from ground if you have an experiment for, you know, planned for 10 years of, of, of operations. And uh, the Quixote telescopes here are basically Spanish technology, ISC technology. You have here the two instruments, the low frequency one, which covers 1 to 20 gigahertz, and the another one that covers 30 to 40 gigahertz. And they are, um, as I say, in operation. But we have been running experiments. Uh, let me <laughs> make a short uh, historical note. Uh, we started with the Tenerife experiment on anisotropy of the microwave background when I was a, a young student involved here <laughs> in this project uh, that last uh, 16 years. Uh, we were the first that confirmed the COVID data on anisotropy of the microwave background because this experiment from ground was very similar to the one that was launched uh, with COVID. And uh, indeed, we were close when, when they announced the discovery of anisotropy and we, uh, we were able to confirm in a strip on the sky that indeed the level of fluctuations at angular scales of 5 to 10 degrees were of order 1.7 parts over okay, uh, uh, 100,000. And then we have done other experiments along the years. In per perhaps I could remark the very small array, which were a was able, it's an interferometer, it was an interferometer, led by the University of Cambridge in this case. Uh, that one was uh, Manchester and ISC. This is Cambridge ISC, and then Manchester involved uh, also here. And um, we were able to measure for the first time some of the peaks of the angular power spectrum of the, of the CMP. Now the Quixote experiment is producing this kind of maps. We can only observe the northern hemisphere, obviously. Uh, so we have here an area which is not accessible. Uh, this is a band that is cancelled by the emission of satellites, uh, which prevent us to do observations in this frequency range, unfortunately. But we can see many things. Uh, this is a polarization map of about 25,000 square degrees made with the Quixote. And for comparison, you have here W map. This is space mission at 23 gigahertz. Uh, we are working here at 11 gigahertz. And well, basically we are extending the frequency range in order to constrain the processes of polarized emission or the microwaves polarized emission uh, in our galaxy. And this is critical in order to search for the imprint of the gravitational waves. So work in our group, in the Cosmology group, has focused on the technology to extend the frequency range to 30, 40 gigahertz. So we have built this instrument, which is now at the telescope. It's in the commissioning phase. And hopefully we will extend uh, the, the search at low frequency, which has been finished, okay, um, with a set of papers now uh, accepted in Molly Notices and will tell us about this. Uh, but now we are extending to the 30, 40 gigahertz. You see here, uh, spinning dust, all the foregrounds that we have to correct in order to really explore the potential imprint of gravitational waves in, in the uh, microwave background. Uh, all these uh, things, uh, synchrotron, uh, spinning dust, uh, free free is not polarized, but you see the CMB over here, so you really need to um, correct very well in order to explore high sensitivity uh, um <coughs> imprints, uh, also weak uh, imprints of the microwave background. So we have this project ongoing, the Japanese project at high frequency, and now, fortunately, uh, under development, and it will be installed next year, this is a project in collaboration with the University of Milano and in Italy and uh, Oxford and some other uh, groups in Rome, and this will come next to, to uh, these two experiments. So the laboratory uh, for microwave studies at Teide Observatory basically consists of the Quixote here 
and this area where we have these two, the ground bird and LSP strip. They will give us maps of the polarization of the cosmic microwave background at 10 frequencies, spanning uh, obviously only on the northern hemisphere, but uh, spanning a large frequency range, which is critical for us to understand the um, contributions from different foregrounds emission processes in our galaxy. In addition, we are building our lab uh, here at the Institute um, CMB spectrometer to measure distortions on the spectral energy distribution of the CMB that could be originated by some uh, processes like, for instance, the decay of particles in the early history of the universe that could have injected energy in early times that may have distorted the, C the, the black body spectrum. So, uh, or other processes or like uh, emission from um, hydrogen or helium or other lines that uh, in the dark era could have um, affected the microwave background. So this is an overview of the activities um, on cosmic microwave background and isotropies and polarization. And in the future, well, we as institute, we will be, or we hope, uh, we are already involved in Lightbird, which is the Japanese mission, uh, very international, but it's Japanese led and uh, which is really the, the major step that we expect will happen at the end of this decade in order um, in the search for the uh, gravitational imprint, a gravitational wave imprint on the polarization of the microwave background. So we are involved there and of course we keep proposing ESA to uh, have a European mission for uh, polarization of the microwave background but uh, with the moderate success so far uh, we have to wait uh, for the future. So Lightbird may be launched in 2030, 2031. And that's our, our immediate goal. So these are the conclusions, but uh, I, don't, I don't need the conclusions for the CMB part of our, our work, but uh, I, will, uh, I will basically uh, end this part saying that uh, with the experiments that we have set at our observatory here, that you will see um, uh, in your visit, we expect to set a limit on, on the ratio of the tensor modes to scalar modes of the level of 0.05. I know that other groups in the world are close to the, that limit, but that's, that's our activity. The group on cosmology and large-scale structure, um, well, is actively working for Euclid, the space uh, mission that uh, will map uh, billions of galaxies in order to trace the imprint of dark matter and dark energy on the history of the, of the structure of the universe. And uh, so here is Carlos Hernandez, is, is one of our leaders. And we, of course, we are not only involved in Euclid for large-scale structure surveys, we are involved in others, like the Dark Energy Survey and other, like uh, the j pass in, in Spain. But uh, I will not uh, mention that, I will simply say that uh, uh, we, uh, as an institute, are uh, heavily involved in, in Euclid with a number of researchers expecting uh, to do uh, great science in the field of uh, CMB cross-correlations with large-scale structure, clusters of galaxies and the properties of clusters of galaxies, and uh, uh, distortions, uh, gravitational lensing, weak lensing, and so on. All this will help to constrain the parameters describing dark energy and hopefully also uh, dark matter. So uh, the launch is expected uh, next year. Finally, has been arranged uh, uh, with the with the SpaceX and ESA will will cover that. The telescope is ready. The instruments are ready, and we are just waiting for this to happen. At ISC, there is a group specifically working on clusters of galaxies, uh, and we are part of a new instrument that uh, is here. We uh, is a multi-fiber spectrograph. We need to measure redshifts, um, uh, large scales, and, and clusters of galaxies, um, including uh, um, well, many different phenomena, are, are a topic uh, of interest for the cosmology group. So we have built this instrument in collaboration with the University of Oxford and other four or five uh, institutes. And this is now under commissioning at the prime focus of the 4.2 meter telescope in La Palma. And this is the next uh, instrument that we will um, hopefully uh, start systematic observations uh, at the level of 1,000 spectra each uh, shot, okay? 
um, the, the previous instrumentation in this telescope was able to provide one spectrum at a time. Now we want to improve by a factor of a thousand, and we will see uh, then the impact it may have in clusters of galaxies and also in stellar, stellar astronomy in, in our galaxy. Okay, these are the two major areas. Now, um, moving to astroparticles, we have the large uh, Cherenkov telescopes that I mentioned. So let's have a closer look. This is the magic, uh, one of the two magic telescopes. You see these telescopes have been running for 17 years. They cover this part of the, uh, of the gamma ray uh, spectrum, okay? And uh, of course they are complementary to many other um, facilities that will explore the processes of acceleration of particles in the universe. Basically it's the core of the science that uh, these telescopes can, can do. This is generically called imaging Cherenkov telescopes. Okay? Let me explain uh, for those who are not so familiar. Um, basically, um, the atmosphere acts as a converter. Okay? We receive the flux of gamma ray uh, photons from many sources, supermassive black holes and supernova explosions. And when these gamma rays get to the upper atmosphere, uh, they break uh, uh, the, nuclear, the, the nucleus of, of our atoms, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on. And uh, they break in subatomic sub particles, and these are, uh, these are uh, showers of, of particles that uh, are uh, at higher speed than the speed of light uh, at the medium, produce Cherenkov light, right? So, these are flashes that uh, last uh, only 10 nanoseconds. That means that the telescopes that we have to build should have detectors that will run at a higher speed. Higher means a few nanoseconds all the time. And because the flashes are in the visible, okay, they are basic, basically collecting visible light. So these are photomultipliers that uh, collect light, and these are the basic uh, features of the uh, Cherenkov uh, uh, telescopes that uh, we are so much interested uh, to build. Um, the um, okay, let me see. Over 30 years, we have been running experiments at La Palma for gamma ray astronomy. So it's really one of the first places where gamma ray astronomy develop. And I have to recognize here the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich, who has been always a leader of this uh, kind of facilities. Now Spain has a significant contribution to it, but uh, in the early times it was basically the Max Planck. More recently, um, the University of Tokyo also joined uh, into these projects, and, and now we have a consortium, in fact, to build a big infrastructure uh, with two sites, one in La Palma and one in Chile, in nearby Paranal, in Paranal basically, in the Atacama the, the Desert, 2,400 meters in both cases, roughly. Um, and you see the countries that are involved in what we call the CTA, the Cherenkov Telescope Array Observatories, okay? Major strategic facility for Europe, okay? And uh, they basically consist of the three types of telescopes, um, telescopes called large, <laughs> medium, and small, okay? 24 meters, 12 meters, I mean, 23 meters, actually, 12 meters and 6 meters in diameter. So the configurations for the North array, array and the South Array are different. The North Array will be mo mo mostly dedicated to explore extragalactic sources, and therefore we need large telescopes, because they are distant, the fluxes are low. And the Southern Array, uh, which is more extended, is mainly interested in um, our black hole in the center of the galaxy and all the processes of gamma ray emission around that or, so, or galactic sources, anyway, at very high energies. So they, they run a higher rare energies, means that about 10 TeV for the uh, small telescopes and in the range 10 to 100 GeV. This is the, the range for the large telescopes and in the middle, well, the middle range. So basically uh, the configurations are set. We are more advanced in the construction here in the Canary Islands than in Chile. In Chile there's only one road, but now we have already one telescope built. But the 
topics, the scientific topics that will be developed are basically uh, listed here. I have taken these pictures from the PI of the large uh, telescopes, uh, Masahiro Tashima, who is um, a collaborator of us from many years. And uh, uh, basically, there are three areas, three major areas of scientific interest for, uh, for the Cherenkov telescope array. The origin of relativistic cosmic particles, understanding the processes of acceleration, uh, proving, of course, seen environments, black holes, supermassive black holes, and exploring frontiers. And that means exploring processes of dark matter annihilation that may produce gamma rays, maybe in the central part of a galaxy or maybe in other galaxies. These are the areas where these uh, telescopes are expected to make uh, major contributions, but who knows? Uh, it's, uh, as I say, it's, it's a very interesting uh, new field, okay? So you see, well, new field, as I say, has been explored for many years, but uh, the sensitivity that will be achieved, I will comment in a minute, will be so great that uh, new processes can be, um, can be discovered. This will be the setup in our observatory in La Palma, okay? The four telescopes of 23 meters and then nine telescopes of 12 meters. And these are the two magic telescopes that are already in operation, okay? 17 meters. This area will be covered by uh, these kind of telescopes and the largest uh, telescope that uh, my institute is in charge to build 50% of this. The other 50% comes from the University of Tokyo, the Max Planck Institute for, for Physics in Germany and other uh, partners, uh, the 23 meter telescopes look like this. You have here the partners, but uh, as I say, we are 50% of all the mechanical structure is built uh, by Spain. And the mirrors actually uh, have been built in, in Japan and the camera here, that's a great, uh, great thing. The camera, which is 2.5 meters in size uh, here, this is 23 meters. The camera is basically built between Japan and Spain. Uh, with for Hamamatsu photomultipliers. So we have already built one telescope and um, and it's there the inauguration of the Japanese style, okay? Um, and this is how it looks like now. You go to the observatory, you will see the two magic and the 23 meters. And we have started this month to the, the other telescopes are built, but we have to install them and we, we have started the process of installation right now. So this is to give you an idea of how things are, are, are going. Now, uh, with the first uh, 23 meter, uh, the commissioning is ongoing, still ongoing, but they have already detected, uh, with this camera, they have already detected uh, crap, uh, a pulsar emission, uh, and gamma rays, uh, and you see the pulses here, if I remember well, it's about 30 milliseconds, uh, the pulses, and, uh, and uh, this was um, an achievement, actually. That means that the things are Expectations are verified, and we will have soon um, new scientific uh, results. Now, this is what I mentioned: that the sensitivity of CTA uh, as a function of, uh, here of integration time, you can compare with Fermilat, for instance. Okay, at uh, different energies, uh, 25 GeV, 40 GeV, 75 GeV. You see, CTA is here, and uh, Fermilat is is here. Okay, so really, it will bring a uh, few orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude of improvement in sensitivity. So uh, let me escape all this process of, uh, of construction simply. Uh, we are, it's such a major <laughs> enterprise now in our institute that I, I, I have to tell you that uh, we are putting a lot of effort into, into this new facility. And as I, I, as I said, this is because of these scientific drivers that I mentioned, okay? And you have here a summary of the things that hopefully we will be able to investigate in the, in the coming years soon. Because the four telescopes, the largest telescope, will be installed in one year, one year and a half. Now I change the, the topic because uh, we also do other things and uh, I wanted to comment. Uh, for instance, we as a group, we have uh, researchers interested to test the stability of fundamental constants on physics, in particular the... Uh, 
the fine structure constant, and we have recently published the best uh, limit on the time evolution in the history of the universe of this, uh, of this constant. You know that there are several models that predict that uh, the constants may, may change, uh, they may have variations at the level of 0.1 parts per million, there are models that pre predict that, and we want to test those models in time scales of 10 to the 9 years. Okay, So um, we have built an instrument that is able to do this. Uh, it's a spectrograph. It is a spectrograph in the visible, uh, ultra-stable spectrograph. The name is Espresso. We were copies of this project. The instrument uh, is located in Chile, and it makes use of the four telescopes of a meter that uh, Europe has built in, in Chile. Um, the most effective way to prove this uh, uh, time evolution, if it exists, uh, you know, there are claims. People, researchers, that have claimed that they have detected variations and that they have even a distribution in the sky. Well, we wanted to test that uh, using the same method, the, the many multiplet uh, method, which uh, measures the wavelength shifts of many different transitions from several atomic species. And uh, we use for that uh, quasars and the matter between the quasars and us. And this matter produces absorption of light and the atoms in that matter, clouds of material, produce transitions that we can detect uh, in, in great detail if we have an instrument like this uh, here uh, with in enough stability and enough spectral uh, resolution. And indeed we did that, the instrument was tested, commissioned, it's in operation, science operation is going well. Um, I will sk sk skip this, um, well, no, uh, let me say that, as I said, w it's, l it's located, this is interesting, it's located in a lab, underground lab, that uh, receives the light from each of the four 8-meter telescopes. This is the most powerful uh, astronomical facility. This telescope, each telescope of 8 meter, but when you combine the four this is the most powerful uh, facility in the world now for optical um, and infrared astronomy. So we make use of that uh, uh, with a system that we designed um, and has been equipped with uh, something um, very important, which is a laser frequency comb that provides basically the calibration and control of the stability. You, you really want to have a exquisite uh, control of the stability if you want to test variations in the value of the um, uh, fine structure constant. And uh, we achieved that with this kind of uh, laser, um, laser comp, which gives you um, a very regular pattern of uh, calibrations uh, lines that we need. The kind of data we collect uh, is this. Uh, you see a spectra of a quasar absorption system. And uh, uh, the first thing we did was to compare with different uh, instruments to actually s our calibration was much better but we wanted to see whether there were any systematics so you have espresso here as compared with another instrument us or espresso here compared with harps now we didn't find any uh, exchange thing but we were sure about our calibration uh, about uh, 20 30 times better than it was done in the past and therefore we were able to ask uh, the question whether there is any variation of alpha by looking at different multiplets. The multiplets are, are listed here. I will not go into details, but uh, what I can tell you is that uh, we have not found evidence, in spite of claims of changes in the value and different equation of social systems made by other groups, we have not been able to uh, detect uh, any, any significant uh, variation of the um, fine structure constant. So here you have a collection of all the measurements in the literature. Uh, you see error bars here. Our work is here, and the error bars are, are here. And basically, if we combine all the different efforts made by people, we arrive to this, okay? 0.5 parts per million with an uncertainty statistical and systematic, which clearly says that uh, at that level, we have no indication of variations of the fine structure constant al uh, along the history of the universe. And the last topic, uh, as I say, in spite of claims by some groups, this is not sustained by our data. And it's recognized that the, the data is among the best uh, ever obtained. 
now I finish by telling you that um, we are starting now a new, a new project which has been awarded um, many nights of observation in preparation for a direct measurement of the expansion of the universe. We all know that the, expansion, the universe is expanding, but uh, we have never measured in direct time, in direct, direct, the expansion rate. And it's possible. It's possible with an instrument like the one that we have built, Espresso. Okay? And, um, and we, we have started in preparation for... This is a long-term program. Okay? We will need 10, 15 years of observations. But uh, the reason is that uh, we expect uh, a change of one centimeter per second per year when you measure the redshift of a given absorption system. Okay? So let me... Uh, we expect that because of the expansion of the universe. Um, one centimeter per second is something that uh, has not been achieved in any astronomical observation ever. Actually, um, we are now uh, at the level of 10 centimeters per second in the best things that we can do with, uh, with Espresso. Okay? Yeah. But uh, if we accumulate a number of years in observations, uh, really we may expect uh, um, with a proper control of the stability by observing uh, this kind of systems, this is a quasar, okay? as, I, as I was explaining, the philosophy of this experiment is basically we will take several quasars, the best that we know, um, we will observe the intervening gas, this is the imprint of the intervening gas, this is the Lyman emission, Lyman alpha emission of the quasar, and by measuring hundreds and hundreds of lines every year or every two, three years, with an ultra-stable spectrograph, we may expect to see any change in the long term uh, if uh, in the future we really uh, measure again with the new generation of telescopes. So we start with the 8 meter class telescopes, but we need in the future to have in the 39 meter telescope that uh, Europe is building in Chile, we need to have such an instrument to continue the observations at a higher sensitivity. So what we are doing now is putting the zero level, okay, uh, having the reference, because in 20 years from now, if an instrument will be built, and we are already working to produce the instrument for this in, in this telescope, um, then we will be able to check whether the accumulated change may get to the 10 centimeter, 15 centimeter per second and show direct evidence. If you measure the, uh, the expansion rate uh, without the model, then uh, obviously you can constrain in a s completely separate way um, the, the parameters of the model of the universe. Okay? So this is our aim uh, um, with other colleagues um, in, in Switzerland, in Italy, and in Portugal, and we, uh, Spain, uh, the IEC, we are working for that. And, well, I have to say that uh, um, we expect also to have the possibility to have a telescope of 30 meter class in, in Tenerife. And, um, well, actually, this one, uh, not only this can be done from Chile, I mean, we could do that also with this telescope either in Hawaii or in La Palma if this telescope is finally built. And we are the backup site for this 30 meter telescope in La Palma. Uh, if it happens that in Hawaii this cannot be built, we will, we, ISC, is particularly interested in building an instrument for this telescope to be able to do this kind of, of research. These instruments are not only useful for this, they can be used also to search for Earth-like planets, measuring velocities of stars at the precision of a few centimeters per second. So, thank you very much for your attention. I'm very, very, ha very pleased to have you all here, and I hope you have a very enjoyable week, uh, uh, two weeks actually, um, during the winter here, winter school. Thanks for your attention. Uh, there any questions? Uh, I'm pleased to take questions. Any question in the audience? Any curiosity about the observatories, <laughs> the projects ongoing in house? Uh, Fabio. Oh, Fabio. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rafael, for the nice overview. Um, okay. Can you say a few more words about the CMB spectrometer? Yes, uh, CMB spectrometer is a project led by Alberto Rubinho, 
uh, that uh, basically will measure uh, potential spectral distortions in the range 10 to 20 gigahertz. It's in that particular frequency range where we will scan uh, many frequencies with a new electronic system that, uh, I mean, we will have horns measuring the sky and uh, a system to um, really uh, explore with high res spectral resolution at all frequencies between 10 and 20 gigahertz. And that um, the idea is that um, some um, predictions, uh, I mean, th in this case, I, I said I would not speak about uh, Carlos' work, but uh, he did uh, with Alberto and, and Rashid Shunyaev uh, and, and others uh, uh, predictions years ago of the potential distortion of the microwave background spectrum because of uh, hydrogen lines, uh, helium lines, and maybe other elements, I'm not sure. Yes, possibly carbon and so on, right? So uh, we want to test as far as possible uh, these ideas because you can learn a lot about the, the processes that uh, happened in that uh, dark era of the universe, but also you can uh, you can see, I mean, if, if you do this carefully, and the calibration is fundamental, as you can imagine, uh, you need really very accurate calibration of the system. Um, you can also test uh, potential injections of energy, whatever is the source in early epochs. Uh, anything that may change in this frequency range, uh, the black body spectrum may be of interest for us to learn about processes in the universe that uh, have been either predicted or may have not been predicted. Okay. Thank you.